and we are live. Go right ahead, Trudis. Good evening, bonsoir, and shalom, and welcome to another open books evening at the Jewish Public Library. We are presenting today, I think, the number five of our virtual literary salons, and there are many more to come. Now, today we are with our own Montreal writer, Norman Rappi. Norman, many of you may know him. Uh, he has been a part of the Jewish Public Library, even a member of our programming committee for a long time, until he told us at one time, as long as we have our meetings at five, late in the evening or at four o'clock, he cannot attend anymore because that's when he gives his seminars. I hope we are going to get him back soon as a member of our programming committee. That would be great. So Norman Ravine, you probably know him already. Uh, he is a Concordia professor, university professor. His teaching and his research interests at the university cover interesting specialties. There are Canadian Jewish studies, the Holocaust studies, religion and literature, ethics, contemporary Canadian and American literature, memoir and creative writing, and with a concentration on a Jewish Eastern Europe, especially Poland. He's a fiction and a non-fiction writer. He's a journalist, he's a literary critic, a specialist in Canadian Jewish studies, and we know that he lives in Montreal. Today he's going to speak about his latest novel. He has written quite a number of them, which I didn't know. Now, the latest one uh, published last year, I think in September 2019, is entitled The Girl Who Stole Everything. Here it is. See the beautiful cover. And it was published by Linda Leith Publishing House. Please go and buy the book. It's very good reading, especially now in summertime when you have time to sit outside. Okay. So it is a fantastic book and it considers the after effects of wartime on the contemporary Polish village of Radzow North, northwest of Warsaw. Uh, its other setting is Vancouver's down and out east side, Vancouver's, which was in the 1950s and 60s, a Jewish business district. I didn't know that. Now, the girl who stole everything was chosen by the Globe and Mail as being among the best works published by Canadian independent publishers in 2019. Um, Norman's books, the other books, quite a number of titles, they have won prizes in Montreal, in Toronto, in Edmonton, and they include just a few titles, Sex, Skyscrapers, and Standard Yiddish, Hidden Canada, and Infinite Travel, and the edited collection Not Quite Mainstream, Canadian Jewish Thought Stories, and A House of Words. Jewish writing, identity, and memory. Well, I think we leave it at that. And um, we are going to welcome Norman to speak about this new book he has written, what made him write about it. And I'm really looking forward to hear more about it. So please welcome him and let's listen. Hi, I'm Norm Raven. Uh, I'm glad to be part of the Jewish Public Library's uh, series of writers. And we have a little oh, chaos here. We'll come right back. Being, um, talking about their work from basements kitchens and couches and the book that i'm uh, presenting is my recent novel uh, the girl who stole everything which is published in montreal it's set in poland 
um, first in Warsaw, and then it moves to a small village um, called Radzanov, northwest of Warsaw, where these groovers played in the square in the 60s. Uh, and it's also set in Vancouver, uh, recent contemporary Vancouver, in particular um, on the east side, or just on the east side, uh, where the city breaks into east and west. Uh, and the street that is here on the screen behind me is called Cordova, uh, where some of the action takes place. In both the Polish village and uh, Vancouver's Cordova Street, uh, the, the place's Jewish history is not really evident too much, but in, in the Polish village, uh, you have a derelict synagogue building uh, and some houses where Jews lived 100 years ago and up to the beginning of the Second World War. And on Cordova Street, you have one storefront, that's this red brick uh, in the 60s and more recently, uh, where the Army and Navy department store is housed and it's kind of the last remnant of what was a strip and a surround of uh, Jewish business life. And in my novel, uh, right around here, a, a murder takes place in a pawn shop. But the characters are young and they're not really uh, steeped in or too fascinated with their uh, Jewish ancestor past. And their novel sort of moves them towards it and they, they stumble over it. And the three key characters uh, are um, a woman called Nadia. She is a student and a musician. And uh, she finds out that her family has a connection with the pawn shop murder. And that draws her to the side of the city. Uh, where she finds that with the neighborhoods change, there are places where she can play music. And um, she, she kind of haunts the area in a, in a way that she doesn't quite understand. Um, it turns out that one of those places is run by a fellow called Simon. He, he has his own familial connection with uh, Poland, which he, he didn't really understand because his father never talked about the fact that he was born in this little village, Radzanov. When the novel makes its way to Poland, uh, those two Canadians meet a kind of a counterpart. That's a woman called Nat Anya. Uh, and she uh, is the, the daughter of a woman who still lives in Radzanov. Uh, and they're sort of our connection to that place as, as the narrative develops. And one of the things that leads these characters paths to cross is music. Uh, and in this presentation, you'll hear some of the music associated with uh, the scenes that I'll read you, and that will be played by my son, Alexander. And the first section that I'll read to you uh, portrays Nadia's experience, her sense of what it's like to go down to Cordova Street and play. Nighttime on Cordova, smells and sounds, a bit furtive, but quiet. I put myself on the list at the shop. Why I'm ready to play there all of a sudden, I don't know. The other stuff's horrendous. How can Simon stand it? The loopy poets. There's the odd sensitive girl in a summer dress. I'm interested in what they have to say. They seem entirely naked. None of the guys make any sense. It's like open stage is some sort of rite of passage for them. But it isn't easy. Some come up with a few too many beers in them. It's a little stage, the size of a dining room table, but you've got to make sure you don't put your foot on or you'll fall off. A country and western swing band comes up and the music's good, but they've got their instruments in each other's faces. The drummer hits his snare and looks like he might topple over on his back. Simon's got staff now, a woman clearing tables and a young guy who takes names for the open mic. For once, I put myself on the list. I tell him, Nadia, I will play two songs on the dulcimer. I sit at the back, deciding how authentic to make it, what sort of pressure to put on myself. I won't play the same things I played out on the stoop. That would be cheap. I take off my coat and put it under my chair. Before I go on, a long-haired guy plays some sort of performance chant piece on an electric guitar covered in electrical tape. What's the deal? Is the thing a fire hazard? I see a few guys in the back start to snicker and step out. Inadvertent hilarity. It comes out of nowhere at open mic. I'm not introduced. They don't do that at Simon's place. I get the signal and I just come up. The room's quiet, but for a few clinking plates and clicking chess pieces. I can hear them calling out, check, 
at the chess tables by the window. When I hit the first notes, I know it's going to work. The dulcimer is so strange and strong. It resonates in the room, a rhythmic chiming, and everyone grows still and quiet. I play a klezmery thing, the way I imagine the guys might have played it in 1890 at a Polish nobleman's wedding, rough and wild. I can tell I've got the audience's interest, so I give it an extra few verses. When I finish, there's a moment of silence, just dead quiet. Then hooting and applause and talk and everything you'd expect from a room full of people who are a little drunk, short on money, and out for a good time on Saturday night. Then I take a chance days, the old Mary Hopkin chestnut. I can still see the Apple record label spinning on my parents' turntable. And I do something I hardly ever do. I sing in my just serviceable voice. Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. It's just one of those songs, a heartbreaker. It's very satisfied, satisfying to sing it out in the room with strange faces gazing up at me. I feel as if I've snuck into a secret cave and uncovered the genie's lamp. And that's it. I know the way out the bath. So I gather my things and head that way. I disappear down the alley I came up in daylight. The locals are doing their stuff out there, smells and sounds, like the scene in Dead Man, where Johnny Depp walks into the railroad town of Machine and gets an eyeful along the way, a real old west free for all. The shop might be one of those old time saloons with horrible poetry instead of honky tonk. The neighborhood, its cut off quality, the way it makes people in the city titter seems clearer to me than ever. So music is kind of a defining aspect of, of Nadia's life. Uh, it's the thing that allows her to become an adult. And it's the thing that takes her, you know, in search of this, this story in the, in the back of her family history. Uh, and then by way of Simon, who finds his way to Poland, it actually also draws her to Poland. Um, he settles down in this village where the house that belonged to his dad's family uh, has been maintained for for uh, decades. Uh, and he over he he overhears the fact that there's a, there's a film project going on which lacks um, a, a dulcimer player. They do play dulcimers in Poland, but they haven't found somebody that's just got the right sound, the right. Uh, feel uh, and they invite Nadja to come and she agrees she says I'll be your dulcimer girl and she uh, comes to supply music for the soundtrack of the movie but also appear in a scene of the movie uh, which is in a way her cameo um, and a kind of a, a unknown experience to her she runs through it very quickly and it's a challenge uh, and I'll read first a little paragraph that just gives you a sense of the approach to Radzanov. Uh, you come up in a car from, from Warsaw. And then I'll read a longer section, which is the scene in which Nadja is uh, a part of the movie that's taking place in the little village. They approach the village on a road that curves through trees. They pass an old wooden church, or is it another rebuilt replica? The village appears around a bend in the road and takes shape upon a central square. On one side, a large white church with its wedding cake steeple, decrepit wooden buildings, newish two-story stucco homes, and much older brick houses. The sky above is the lightest blue. The driver turns his head as they roll to a stop and says, Radzanov, Market Square. Nadia gets out to stretch. And there in the doorway is Simon. So they have a kind of a an encounter, sort of a cinematic, maybe only partially um, believable scene. Um, and then Nadia is rushed off because they need her to do her thing and time's wasting. So here is the film set as she uh, takes part in it. And it begins with an, another character's voice. She's called Charlie. She's the production manager of the scene. Okay. Charlie points to a chair that sits on a rise in the meadow some 20 meters off. You sit there, we'll film, we'll film from the back. And with that, she points at a raised platform from above as well. The chair is miked. In Warsaw, we'll have you play the same piece in case we need a film. What is this field? Nadia wonders aloud as the camera people jostle with their equipment. Charlie glances at her a little shyly. We needed something, you know, 
unpeopled, with a good view into the distance. She waves at the trees, the escarpment, the cloudless sky. They walk toward the chair. Nadia settles herself on it. We need you, Charlie says, to sit still when you play. Nadia puts her boots firmly on the grass and gets her instrument in place mid-thigh to feel the right looseness. She gives the strings a strum. Charlie hovers nearby and then is gone. Gazing into the distance, Nadia wonders if she will ever again play music in so strange a setting. So, Charlie's back. Are you ready? Nadia nods. Her song is titled Romanische Fantasium. Of the recordings she sent as possibilities, it's the one that fit the filmmaker's idea of a Jewish-Polish song, or a Polish-Jewish song, depending on who she corresponded with. Charlie had written to say the director thought Nadja played like an old Polish blues man. Burn this after reading, she wrote. Can you believe he said that? Charlie lays a light hand on Nadja's shoulder and speaks quietly. When I've backed off, count 50. Then play. You won't be aware of us at all. The camera guy will be able to shift, shift his depth of field, so we'll bring you in close, okay? Nadja nods. Once Charlie is out of view, she counts from 50 down to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, slowing herself at 4, 3, 2, 1, and into the slow repetition of the song's first chords. A bird calls, and she takes this as her cue to shift into the quicker pace at the center of the song, a world of rhythm, much faster than the rest which might have once given dancers at a wedding what they needed to propel the bride up on a rickety chair, like the one she sits on. Ecstatic music. Then back to the slow, stately march in order for the song to close in on itself and return to where it started. It's a song that could effectively go on forever, in and out of its fast and slow sections. Nadia listens to the way the dulcimer sounds in the meadow. As she nears the song's final movement, a crazy thing happens. In the near distance, by a line of fence posts, a figure appears, bent over at first, then upright, carrying something under her arm. The figure comes closer, and Nadia sees that it is a, a woman, old and stout. She carries a basket under one arm. Her hair is white against the greens and browns of the countryside. The woman stops to listen. This is a distraction, but Nadia winds the song up without a hitch. She sits still, hands on the dulcimer strings. The crew begins to grumble and call in Polish. That was great. Charlie rushes by, heading toward the woman on the field. Nadia watches as they talk. Then the old woman walks off toward town. Charlie makes her way back. That was beautiful. The crew loved it. That, she points at the old woman heading down the road, we didn't expect. But we're going with it, a little local flavor, okay? Nadia's time in Poland is short. Um, she she is rushed back to go to Vancouver, but Simon stays put, uh, and he's sort of the, the adventuresome figure, the test figure. And one of the things uh, that I've been asked about when I presented the book uh, naturally, is what's going on? What's this idea that you could um, immerse yourself in contemporary Poland in this way, especially from the perspective of uh, a young Jewish person? So that's part of the you know, struggle of the book is to convey how this might be done and what the stakes are and why you might want to do this. And uh, in Simon's case, he, he almost doesn't know. And some of the circumstances that lead him to do it are not totally uh, under his control. And one of the things that he's on the search for when he settles down in this little village uh, is a place that's referred to in the novel as the secret place. Uh, this is something from before the war that was known to have been kind of a source of um, herbal remedy and, and uh, herbal health. Uh, and the, the history is that his family was kind of in charge of it. So he would like to see it again. Uh, so one of the ways that you see Simon enter the Polish uh, landscape, in this case, the, the you know, entirely rural landscape, is via a canoe trip that he takes. Uh, the area around the village is a, a, a canoer's paradise. And then also he uh, gets to this, he thinks, maybe this secret place. Of course, he's not absolutely sure that he's found it. 
What would a secret place contain? Herbs, bark, flowers to be dried and ground. He's not thought properly about this. It's not something he can ask the locals about. Any appreciation of the landscape has to come by stealth, or he's, as he's doing now, by what he thinks might be called an archive of the feet, walking and gathering. He sets his little knapsack down and opens it. Inside, a notebook the size of a paperback novel. Carefully, he gathers as many different plants as he can find, paying attention to leaf and stalk, scent and bloom. He uses a small flat stone to scrape lichen from the trees. There are oak and maple and others he can't name. He places each distinct plant, root, leaf, bloom on its own page in his notebook, using a bit of scotch tape to fasten them. With a rubber band, he fastens the book of collected specimens shut and slips it into his bag. He settles on a patch of grass, which is not quite a clearing, but which offers a full view of the sky. Without meaning to, he falls asleep, one hand under his head as a pillow. When he wakes, everything is as he found it, but of course nothing is familiar. The rest of the canoe ride passes as a kind of blur. His mind is set on returning to Radzanov to find out what he has collected, what the wealth of the shoreline provides. He might be a medieval village magician in training who's been sent out to learn his trade. When the GPS confirms that the white spire in the near distance belongs to the church at Pomyakovo, he pulls the canoe to the riverside. Here the river valley is wide and flat, with forested plains off to the east and west. The bank is sandy. A series of hydro wires supports some 50 feet high skirts the bend in the waterway. He's left the lonely discoveries of the river behind in an instant. He must get the canoe over to the church, across a rough field with no obvious path. He cuts through high grass, then joins, rut, joins ruts whose parallel lines aim more or less at the church. But almost immediately, he's met by a group of horses coming from that direction. They are big chestnut colored with flaxen manes. Simon places the canoe face down and watches as they mosey by, heads low, sampling the grassy way. It takes the animals a long time to pass. He waves at the teenager who gu guides them at the rear. Clutching the canoe, he heads for the church. His pickup, Charlie told him to look out for a black Skoda, is not there. So he puts the canoe by the building's wall where the rental guy will see it. He peers inside the church's big front doors. The pews are full of gray-haired parishioners. Something special is taking place. There's a calendar of events in the vestibule, but Simon cannot read anything on it beyond numbers, dates, times of day. It's remarkably bright inside, walls painted the color of pumpkin, and a pair of brilliant chandeliers hanging from the vaulted ceiling. Their light reflects off the gold and white painted altar. Back outside, the sky has begun to cloud over, and the ev evening is turning indigo violet at the horizon above the trees the skoda rolls up the driver gets out to open the door for him offering a wordless nod in greeting simon sets his bag with his specimens beside him on the seat and they head home he cannot stand the idea of a silent ride the guy up front like a servant and himself in back like royalty so he asks the only thing he can think of that the two of them might have to talk about how's the film shoot going the driver makes eye contact for the first time via the rear view mirror. He shrugs, eyebrows raised. I can't complain. Good driving weather. What about the shoot? Too many actors dressed as Nazis. You know, to hell with them. These guys, it's like they think the dogs are theirs. Simon thinks about this. He's been distracted. He realizes by all the film paraphernalia, trucks, Vintage motorcycles with their clattering sidecars. The antiquarian in him had been drawn to these. Tomorrow you can see a big scene in the square. I'm bringing the director out for it. Well, a show for them all tomorrow. So those are my uh, few entrees uh, into the Polish side of the novel and the Vancouver side of the novel, which as you work with it, uh, start to chime. Uh, and thanks again for tuning in.
Are you back? Hi, Trudis. Hi. Um, if we are back um, on the screen, I would like to ask a few questions. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank Norman for, off uh, for offering us an intro introduction to the background of the book, um, the interest he may have raised and the questions which may be coming. But in any case, uh, to buy the book, which is very readable, easy, easy to get into, also the division of the chapters and the parts of the book. Um, but there is one question for me which struck me right away, and that was why Vancouver? as the new world place in comparison to the old world place in Poland. Why not Montreal? Why not Toronto? Because there is there are followers here with waves of uh, newcomers um, after World War II. Um, so my question was right away, why Vancouver? And sure. We have mentioned some already uh, before, but but still, I, I'm still amazed at that. Uh, what attracted you to it? Okay, well, uh, you know, I know the other two cities that you mentioned well, and I, and I like them. Um, and Van <clears throat> Vancouver is a city I've written about before. And the part of the city that I'm largely dealing with in this book uh, is really the old side of the downtown, which has become a, a in many ways a problem for the city, although it's undergoing uh, regeneration. But the quirk in the story about that part of town is that in the 40s and the 50s, it was a Jewish business district. And that's a story that has generally not been told. And many of the patterns and the elements that you would have in Toronto on Spadina or here on the main, uh, you have in Vancouver on Cordova Street. Uh, so that would be, I guess, one of the book's challenges that you shift your s state of mind in terms of thinking about uh, Jews in the Thank earlier you. part of the 20th century and place it there. And then once you start to encounter the characters, you get a sense that uh, a lot of the patterns and uh, family, pa f family experiences are somewhat alike, but they've got their own Vancouver spirit. The Vancouver angle of it makes it fun, I have to say. Uh, and the possibility of, of doing it new, it's fresh. Yeah, that's, that, that's the other question. Is it known? Is it well known? For me, it was something completely new. But yes. I'm a newcomer to this country anyway, and my home has been Montreal, part of it Toronto too, but basically Montreal. But Vancouver, it was always a sightseeing tour, a tour yeah. on the coast, which, which had no now, you know, the prairies, yes, I mean, many of the, Ukraine, the, the Jews from the Ukraine and from Poland, other parts of Canada, but, but Vancouver, is it known? Is it known to people or did you want to make it known with the novel? Well, like, you know, so it's a, it, it's a good question. The, the answer is largely not. Um, but once you dig into it, it's not as if you're picking at crumbs. There's a lot there. Um, and the thing that I had to work with as the sort of kernel is a natural event that took place in Vancouver, which has to do with what is now the Skid Row. So I was working with history that I was turning over into fiction. Uh, and part of what drew me to the Vancouver way of doing this is what I know about Vancouver in the 60s. So uh, my avenue through uh, the city is in part how I know it contempor contemporarily, but then the, the, the history of those uh, streets was what I wanted to bring out as well. Okay, and then the other thing is, which is new and refreshing in a certain way for me at least, um, why the young generation at the center, in the center really? Why the young yeah. generation? Yeah, half why? my age, the character. They're, they're fun. The, the characters are half my age. Uh, the one thing for sure is that they're not uh, bound down, right? They're in a time of life when they don't have family, they don't have children. Uh, their relationship to their parents is also kind of open-ended and nebulous because they're at an age at which the parents are not necessarily so terrifically important. And they're also a generational group 
that I think of being a bit different than myself, at distance, as I say in the video, from their Jewish past. In some yeah. way, the thing that the book uh, presents to them, the way the characters move into the narrative, is that they stumble over these aspects of Jewish ancestry. Happens in Vancouver, happens in Poland. The idea of that for me was, it'd be fun to watch characters not have the heart for it till it kind of landed on them. And then the narrative takes them forward, whether it's on the Vancouver side or e even more strangely, you could say in a, in a village in Poland. So there the, the two different settings have kind of set similar pressures uh, related to the question you're asking. That is, um, you know, what, what is there to tell Jewishly about Cordova Street? Well, a lot. And what is there to tell Jewishly about this little village in the Polish countryside where there are, of course, no Jews till I show up? Um, a lot. Uh, and in that way, the two settings kind of, they rhyme, they, uh, they, sh they share these qualities. You know, what I find fascinating is too, like, I'm, I'm German, and I've moved here 55 years ago. Um, I have a Canadian passport, but my training and my, my university training, my teaching was related to German Jewish studies at McGill. And um, uh, I was looking at this generational issue, which might attract the book also to the younger generation. Because if I think of my kids, um, they are now in their 40s, but there was always this feeling which you mentioned and touched upon before, well, mom, it's your history now, stop. Uh, I mean, yes, we know this. It's the end of World War II. Things have happened, things have moved on into the future. We will live with the past, but we are living now and we have to reconstruct. And what I find right. interesting in the book too, that they are younger, number one, but they are becoming interested in a very different way. And the binding object seems to be music. Yes. That's another thing which I found interesting, even the instrument, because I said, why did he choose that? I mean, he could have chosen no. something else. So uh, it, it, it's sort of interconnected to the makeup of a different generation. Um, yes. Can you say something about it? Well, music is, I mean, it's, I'm glad you mentioned it. I mean, music is so central to the whole narrative. Yeah. And the characters in different ways are bound up in, in music, whether uh, in their life in Canada or once they get to Poland. Um, and it's a kind of a, it's a shared space too, historically, because there's ways that Jewish music and Polish music uh, influenced and talked to each other for, for you know many many years that we don't think about anymore so further once the canadians get themselves to poland there's a lot there that's foreign to them but one of the things that they can access and they can take part in and nadia is the main character for this um is they, they can insert themselves into the music that's uh, being used in this film that's being uh, uh, shot in the little village so music is almost like a, a, a stream or a, a kind of a track that they that they run on, and surprising things come out of their willingness to follow it that do, as you say, have to do with Jewishness and identity, which may not have been their their goals in the first place. M music sort of becomes a motivating factor in the book. Yeah, but you know, it, it's also what I found interesting because if you think of Berlin, you may have visited. Uh, on your way to Poland, um, but um, the center really, which forms the new Jewishness of the city, there's always been a Jewish city. And that was all my studies go back to the beginning of Jews in Berlin. But again, it has become a center for young Jews moving there from all parts of the world, even from America, but from Israel, from wherever you want. And uh, one of the bound, the binding um, forces seems to be music. The music scene there yeah. shapes them. And I found yeah. that interesting. Did you know that? Or was it just something you felt for Canada, for your generation and the generation of your children perhaps too? Uh, well, the, 
the thing you describe in Germany certainly goes on in Poland, you, you would know. Uh, and the centers of it in Poland are specific and Krakow is, is really the lifeblood of it, but you find it too in, in other major places. So... Uh, oh, I'm losing you. I'm losing your voice. I'm losing... Why did I lose your voice? Yeah, I think I'm back. Yeah, it came back. Good. Okay. Um, so the thing you describe uh, knowing in, in, in Berlin, certainly you, you, you can't miss it in Warsaw and you surely can't miss it in Krakow. And my age group then is, so you're, you're putting the puzzle pieces together, they are the group that have, uh, if they've got a kind of a cultural glue uh, and, and a way that has maybe drawn them to Eastern Europe, music is a, is a, is a likely draw. And the character who you hear a little bit about in the video, Nadia, who's a musician herself, becomes a sort of a, she's an inevitable draw. She ends up getting invited and uh, the scene that I read in the Little Village is her, uh, her cameo. She's gonna play this music for the soundtrack of a Polish movie about the Second World War. And another thing is, do you speak Polish? I have no Polish, mm -hmm. I have some Yiddish. Okay, have yeah, some Yiddish. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, but you have visited Poland a few times, I read in some of the articles. Eight, eight or nine, eight or nine, yeah. Uh, and um, did you introduce the book there? Did you, will it be translated into Polish? Uh, yes. Is it translation planned? Uh, did okay. you go there and what was the reaction? Uh, yes. How did you communicate with them and so on? These are, they are interconnected. So thanks for asking that. That's important to me and to the book. Um, I have lots of colleagues and friends there. They tend to be excellent English speakers. So when I go into this context, and I, I have had lots of opportunities to read my fiction there, I'm reading to people with English, which is at least as good as mine. And they're often interested in North American literature and sometimes Jewish literature. So my uh, fault line and the absence of Polish is only a, a small problem. It's a problem, but it's it's it it doesn't prevent uh, you know c communication and access, but uh, ways of us getting to know each other. And the novel was launched in Lodz uh, in the fall of 2019 at a wonderful place in the central part of the city. Uh, and that was a kind of a literature house where, where the Polish writers uh, get their books launched. It was the best imaginable launch for this kind of a book because uh, it, it demands a Polish readership, I think. And there were lots of young people in the audience and that was satisfying. But the present story is I haven't got a translator for it, though I'm working on that. And I sure hope we can get it out in, in Polish. And the thing about that is that in Poland, they really still love books uh, and you want to get into a market like that. So there's all kinds of things about it that I, I hope I can work out. It, it's a good and, question. Yeah, another question. Yeah, because it, I think the, the connection, to make the connection from here to there, um, especially via the young generation and their tools which connect them, um, travel, <clears throat> being curious about the past or becoming again curious about the past, not just yeah. shutting it off. But yeah. I want to go back to that one thing. What role uh, do the Germans, or I should perhaps say, the history of the Germans play for you and the yeah. book and the story? That's also a good question. <laughs> so, so um... You know, the novel is set largely in contemporary, when it gets to Poland, it's in contemporary Poland. But by the late stages of the novel, so you know this, uh, the story of the village in the wartime is told. Yeah. And much of what I tell there is historic, is, is accurate. I didn't, I, I had no interest in making that stuff up. Uh, I knew some of it, I developed and researched it and took a lot of time uh, over it on the way to being able to deal with it in a novel. And in that section, of course, the behavior and the role of Germans in the wartime uh, is crucial, but it's seen in that case through the perspective of Poles. So it's another idiosyncratic decision on my part, I would say. The character then who is the avenue for that is the mother 
of the th the third young character. She's called Anya. The mother is uh, a, a much older woman, uh, and she was a child in the wartime. And her stories of the wartime include stories, of course, of Germans and what happened to the village. Uh, but it's very much then told from the ground, you know, a child's point of view of how the village was in these years when everything was a disaster. Uh, and even on the way out of that section at the end of the book, which is the lone section where you go back, the, you know, pretty substantially into the past, uh, I think whom you mostly see are Jews and Poles. And uh, you hear about Germans, but you don't necessarily see too many. Um, and this is a definite problem in Holocaust writing, and I don't necessarily think of my book as a Holocaust book. Um, but I think... If Trudis's question is something that it's a challenge for me and then maybe for readers, the thing is to sense, uh, maybe I'll ask you, uh, in what way what happens to Poles, what befell Poles in the wartime signals Germans, their, their behavior, their, their um, awfulness, uh, their willingness to destroy these places. Uh, that aspect I hope comes through in the short section, which is a historical portrait in some ways of the, of the little village. Is that, is that fair to say of the late stage of the book? Yeah, yeah, because it, it has to come in. That relationship was a very, very critical relationship. Uh, it has been mended in a certain way. Uh, we call it Aufarbeit at one point, and the willingness, of course, of historians and teachers to bring Poland and Germany together in spite of the extreme crash and what happened. But still it has to be dealt with, even with the younger generation, and it is being dealt with. And how to express that in a novel is difficult. And uh, I just want to lead you to, to a quote of you, in fact, which touched me in a way uh, because I'm one of those people who was born before the war and I spent and I come from Cologne, a city which was uh, largely destroyed except for the cathedral. Uh, so lived my first seven, eight years more or less in bunkers and uh, was a very different victim of a kind of a war which I had nothing to do with. I just happened to live there like anybody, any child living yes. in war zones. And the wounds are very different kind of wounds, but they are there. And uh, you, I quote you here, in your collection of the nine literary essays, and I think that this will all help for people to read the book. They should read your other things too. In that collection, A House of Words, you wrote, and I quote, I often find a deep lack of knowledge of the role of Jewishness in Jewish literature. I make use of my own family background and my own connection with European Jewish history to help me investigate Jewish literature, quote end. So in your latest book, The Girl Who Stole Everything, how has your interest and knowledge about European Jewish history helped you um, to historically recreate Jewish life in the storyline of the novel. Right. So crucial. Your own, your own interest, knowledge, work, research, teaching, writing. Yes. yes. So it's too big to answer properly. But um, uh, one way I could answer it is that the, the village that you see me read about and then you see a couple images of uh, in the video is my ancestral place. So I didn't make that, I, I wouldn't make such a place up. I would not write about another place. Uh, the first thing you were uh, quoting uh, still goes. So for me, my access to that place uh, was completely related to my own family and personal connection to it. And yet, uh, I, I took a very long, long, long time to think I could write in fiction about it. And that mostly had to do with revisiting it. 
So uh, I would go back, I would go back. The first trip is very good. The second trip is not useful. The third trip quite good. The fourth one maybe didn't need to do it. And then the research starts to uh, hedge it all up and, and help develop it. So that the thing that you raise when you quote me there uh, is so crucial to the novel, both in Poland and Vancouver, personal and historical. So that uh, the safe place for me is not to be making things up when it comes to some of the things you're... I lose you again. I lose the sound. Okay, how about now? Yeah, you're there. Good. Good. Uh, yeah. So you, you sort of raise something which is a kind of a scaffolding in the novel. That is the personal. Then it is the visits then it is the research, uh, then it is the decision, how this could be framed in fiction. Um, and the, the, the project you describe in that quote that you read from something I wrote 23 years ago is still my, it's my, mo it's my way of operating, per personal and historical, so uh, connected and, and, and working in the particular so that I should not ever be generalizing ever about a Polish village. I don't want to be doing that. I want to be doing my best to convey this, this place and then all the, the related things that, that your questions have been raising uh, as they might emanate from that place. Again, because I'm very, I'm not Jewish. Um, I was educated in a, in a Catholic convent until age 19. So you see, I come from a very different part of the world and education and also what is perhaps fascinating, coming from Cologne, which was the oldest um, Jewish settlement in Germany, um, that was my interest in the very beginning, what happened to the Jewish world in Cologne and uh, my research. And that is why the culture studies uh, I followed uh, in Germany, they have to do with German Jewish cultural issues. So it's something which will never leave me the question. And that's why your quotes in the House of Words, some of them hit me, especially what is the main feature if you can, it's probably not a fair question. The main feature of knowledge of the role of Jewishness in Jewish literature. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Canada, that has a particular problem, which has maybe become a little less dire. That is that uh, Jewish writers were read. There's no doubt about that and they were reviewed and they got accolades. Yeah. But, whether, but whether when they were read and reviewed and received those accolades, the Jewishness in their writing was comprehended and sort of opened up and made clear to readers, I, I would say has been a, a long-standing problem here. Not in the same way in the United States. I, I would not, I, if I were an American, I wouldn't be saying that. So the thing that you're raising there is something maybe I could have been a little more careful about. I mean, it's it's a problem for, it's not good if a Jewish book is reviewed without proper, careful, attentive uh, 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 work with the aspects of Jewish identity, Jewish history, whatever it is, Jewish music uh, being brought out. So when I'm working as a, as a critic or a journalist, I'm concerned about that. And when I'm working as a fiction writer, I guess I would always have to be uh, hopefully careful that the way I'm presenting these things, so you're saying, why Vancouver? The novel should uh, convey to the reader, oh, this is, a, this is something Jewish, uh, Van Vancouver, Vancouverly, uh, that I didn't get. I, I didn't know it. And now once I've read this novel, I get it. Okay. So your question, your question is, uh, is, is uh, it's right on the mark in some way. Yeah, and then I end with one because I, our time is running out uh, slowly. When I do visit Vancouver next time. Yes. <laughs> to Cordova Street, 
will I find signs of Jewish life there? And if no. not, because that is what I frequently do when I travel. I try to find places, uh, shapes of places, yeah. elements of places uh, where Jewish life took place and yes. was part of the life there. So if I do go to Vancouver and go to Cordova Street, will yeah. I feel or see signs like in some little villages in Germany, there are little plaques somewhere and I know there was a shul and nobody knows what for that plaque is there. And if I don't find signs, is there a museum which keeps this history alive for me and I could just dive into it and find out something right. about it? No signs, no. Um, but if you go with the right guide, yes. Uh, and the novel uh, is, a, is a contributor to that kind of a walk and it, it would work as that too. Um, and there is a, a, a museum associated with an archive and um, Holocaust Center in Vancouver and they run a lot of walking tours. You know, walking tours, tours are, are happening here. They're happening in Vancouver as well. And the walking tour guy will point to these buildings and tell you this here and that there in 1940, 1962. Uh, but otherwise, no, if you just wander and take it easy, uh, it's, it's all lost. It is lost. So, but then um, I think we have to thank you for making it come to life and opening up a real opening up a real different place and territory where we have to look for for those traces so thank i want to thank you for having been with us i want to thank roxana for her program skills and yeah. her way to be able to convince Canadian writers like you to come and spend the evenings with us and yep. introducing us to not only this extremely enjoyable book to read, I hope everybody is going to get it. I was told today that you can actually get it at Costco if you uh -huh. cannot go to Indigo yet or order it and so on. Okay. Oh, that it is on their shelves there, which is fantastic. And um, we thank you for having been here. We thank Roxana, the Jewish Public Library. We thank Maria, our technical director. We can do without her. Yeah, who leads yeah. us into these evenings. And I thank you very much. I, I really learned a lot. Thank you very much for your patience. Thanks, thank Trudis. It was thank fun. You.